you know, as we've uh, gone throughout this series, been talking a lot about uh, the path that we're called to walk as Christians. The invitation, we start with the invitation that Christ gives us, um, which is that of a disciple. And that the call of a disciple um, is to follow Christ, right? It is to become more like Him, um, that that won't always be easy, uh, that that is going to lead sometimes, oftentimes, to the suffering. It's going to lead to the putting to death of our own wills, our own natures, uh, to embrace God's will, to, 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 uh, to desire God's will above our own will. And so as we get to this, um, to this topic of suffering as true worship, you know, the, <clears throat> the first mention of anything in the Bible, any particular thing or any topic is always particularly important. Um, you know, it's, it's particularly significant because you have this idea, the Bible talks about precept upon precept. And so the first time you see a particular thing mentioned, you're kind of setting your foundation oftentimes for that, that particular thing. And then every other time you see it mentioned, it's just building upon that precept upon precept to helping you understand what that is. And so if, as, if you look at worship, the, the first mention of worship in the Bible is probably not what you'd expect. Right? Because if you think of worship, you think of music, you think of singing, you think of, um, of praising God, you tend to think of worship uh, in that way. But if we look at the first appearance of worship in Scripture, what it describes is a profound act of, uh, of sacrifice and of suffering. That's what we see with worship. So we're going to go to the story of Abraham, um, and this is going to recount the first mention of worship in Scripture. So this is in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, we're going to read verses 3 to 5. And this is the story of, of course, Abraham going to, to sacrifice Isaac. So it says that Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So that's the first mention of worship in the Bible. And you know, I think it's interesting because Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice to God is essentially here being equated to worship. Right, that's very different, I think, than what we would oftentimes picture worship as. And again, that first mention is significant because the meaning is often found in Scripture and first occurrences. Right, the first time we see something, this is the real meaning of it. And not that that's the only application, but it's giving, here's the true kind of heart behind a particular concept. And I think, you know, Abraham had a very different concept of worship than oftentimes the, the church does today. And, you know, so we could say, well, that's, that's a fun fact. Um, that's, that's nice to know, but why is that actually important? Like, what can I actually do with that information? And I think it's important because what we see throughout the Old Testament that, is that there's no act in the entire Old Testament that's more pleasing to God than this. Right? There's no act in the entire Old Testament that is more pleasing to God than this costly act of obedience from Abraham. Right? And because of that, if, if we go to verses 15 and 18 of that same chapter, we see that the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, 
because you have obeyed my voice. And so God made these promises to Abraham, promises that eventually extend to us because of this act of obedience, which was equated to, to worship. Now, I think it's probably fairly difficult uh, to imagine just the, the conflict, probably the pain that Abraham would have felt uh, during this journey, because obviously he's going to, he's waited, he's had this promise of, of Isaac. He's had, uh, he has this, his only son, and God's called him to, to sacrifice him. So I'm sure that's, that's very difficult. That would be a very difficult uh, journey to go on, a very difficult decision to make. But he walked this afflicted path. Very literally, he walked three days to where he would sacrifice Isaac. And at any point, as he's walking that path, he could have turned back. I'm sure he probably thought about turning back. He probably wanted to turn back, uh, but he didn't. He kept trusting God. He obeyed God. And I think, you know, we, we talked at uh, different points as we've gone through this, uh, this series about kind of the Gethsemane moment for Christ, right? Just before going to the cross at Gethsemane, asking God that if there was any other way um, to accomplish his will, that he would basically rather not go to the cross. You know, if there's another way, that'd be great, but your will be done. And it said his soul was sorrowful to, unto death. And I think this is very similar probably for Abraham, that his, his soul, his, his own will, his own desire here is being crushed as, as unto death. He's, his will is being, his own soul is dying away so that he is focused solely on God's will. Because I think this is very clearly not Abraham's will, right? It's not Abraham's will that he kill Isaac. But he's obeying God in this. He's trusting God. And that's really the bottom line here, I think, is that Abraham trusted God and is interested in. So what is Abraham trusting God for? Because years earlier, God promised to bless Isaac. And Abraham, of course, believed that God's promises cannot fail. Right? He believed in that. So I think... I know that Abraham fully anticipated having to sacrifice Isaac. He fully believed as he was going there throughout that journey that the end result would be that he would sacrifice Isaac. And yet he also believed that if he went through with that, that God would raise him from the dead. And that's just not conjecture. Hebrews chapter 11 says that very thing. Hebrews eleven seventeen to 19. It says there that by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So Abraham had such faith and trust in God that even if he were to go through with this sacrifice, he believed that God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. He had that belief because he knew that God would not go back on his promises. So if we go back now again to the, uh, the idea of worship, again from Genesis 22:5, when Abraham says, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Yeah, I don't think that this, again, this idea of worship, that as Abraham is, is walking this path, as, as they're taking this journey, I don't think that he was marching along singing. Um, I don't think he was rejoicing in that moment about the goodness of God. Um, I don't think that's what worship was to Abraham. Instead, I'm pretty sure he's probably walking along fairly quietly. And this is my own under interpretation, but I believe he's probably walking on pretty, pretty quietly, probably fairly full of contemplation, uh, a lot of probably internal struggle. Um, but earlier in this passage, it does, it hints towards um, this kind of silent, uh, I think, introspection that Abraham was going through in verses 7 and 8 of Genesis 22. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. <clears throat> 
He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. There's a couple things in here, but first we see, so Abraham, Isaac, they're walking along silently together. And then Isaac just has this exclamation of, my father. And Abraham says, here I am. Probably Isaac is seeing that Abraham probably seems very distant for him to kind of show it out, my father, and Abraham to confirm, yes, here I am, I'm here I am with you. Abraham probably felt very, or, or seemed very far away, probably seemed very lost in thought, as I'm sure he was. You know, just the thought of what he was going to do uh, to Isaac, that he had to, just the thought of killing Isaac. And so if we just examine that experience, I think what we can see is that worship doesn't necessarily involve our tongue. It doesn't necessarily involve speaking. It doesn't necessarily involve singing. I think true worship is much more profound than, than just that. It's more profound than the things that come forth from our, from our mouths. It comes, I think, from the very depths of our souls. It comes from within us. It comes from, again, those wills, those desires, those emotions, our very souls pouring forth to God. And so I think worship is revealed in both faith and obedience. Again, Hebrews eleven seventeen. by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. So by faith, Abraham obeyed. I think that's worship. And I think it requires, if we go to the example of, of Abraham, it requires confidence, first of all, in the faithfulness of God, for us to actually obey God when he calls us down uh, a painful path or an afflicted path that involves sacrifice in some way. And I think we need to really believe that God has our best intentions at heart, that God uh, will work things together for our good when he calls us down that path. Um, because although he may guide us down, lead us down that an afflicted path, we need to trust the one that is guiding us. We need to trust the one that this is the path that I would have you walk. Uh, it may not be easy, it may involve sacrifice, but just trust me. And so, I mean, therefore, I, would, I think that there's no more profound act of worship than for us to demonstrate confidence in the goodness and faithfulness of God. I think that's what we're talking about when we talk about worship. You know, if we go back to Hebrews 11 and go back to verse 6 before we read about Abraham. The author says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. All right, so God is looking for faith. And that's where we, we go into the example of Abraham. When Abraham, had, he had faith in God. And when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. That When he was tested, he obeyed God. And so we see this focus on faith, and, uh, and Peter came to understand that value uh, God places on faith as well, I think. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7, we read this last week, uh, but read it again. He says that, that in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I don't usually, um, I don't usually read from the message. It's not my favorite version or translation of Scripture. Uh, but I looked it up, uh, this passage, in the message, and I thought that it actually really captured uh, the meaning quite well. So I want to read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7, uh, the latter half of 6. Uh, in the message, because Peter there says that pure gold put in the fire comes out of it pure, uh, comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, 
that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. And so I see here is proof of faith. You can have faith, but God wants to prove it. That was the case with Abraham. You know, once he went through with this, God said, I, now I know that you trust me. Now I know that you have faith. You've displayed your faith. You know, I can see that now. It's this proof of faith. You can see a similar thing with Job. We get a little bit of back uh, kind of side notes with, with Job in that, you know, Job's not aware of this conversation going on between God and Satan. Uh, but Job was put to the test. God said, here's the most essentially righteous man on earth, so you can test him, but it's going to prove his faith. Right? So I think God will allow those testings, those times of trial, those times of suffering to happen, because he's trying to prove your faith. Because faith without testing, sometimes it doesn't have the opportunity to come to the surface. Right? I think that's, that's part of this process that we need to go through. I think, again, if we go back to just this idea of worship, this idea that it's not just words, words alone aren't proof. Because you can speak things, you can sing things that aren't a reality in your life. Right? We can, you know, I think of the song, which I, I mean, I like the song, I Surrender All, good song. Um, we can sing that and not mean it very easily. Right? We can say, I surrender all, and it's a great concept, and you sh that should be a goal. Um, but if you sing that, and then you're not willing to come to the point of actually surrendering all, uh, then what value has it been? You can speak it, and it doesn't necessarily become a reality. And so that's where I think that words alone, words are good, words are important, but if they don't actually shed light on what's true, then they're just empty. Peter also, also compares uh, faith to gold. He said that faith is more precious than gold that perishes. And it's, I think gold is an interesting kind of uh, example that he used here because one of the greatest drivers of gold's value is its scarceness. Right? If gold was uh, you know, as common as coal, it wouldn't really have very much value. Right, so part of gold's value is how scarce it is. And I think faith is similar to gold in that aspect. Right? It's uncommon. Right? How many in Abraham's day would have actually manifested the same faith that Abraham had? Right? It was uncommon. Same in Job's day. You know, how many today would manifest that same kind of faith? Again, I think it's, it's an uncommon thing. But Peter also mentions that that gold needs to be refined by fire. You know, that gold is put to the test. And Peter is saying that our faith is proven and made pure through fiery trials that, as we place our trust in God. So as we're trusting in God, we will, our faith will be proven. It will be tested. And the outcome of that proven faith, as we see from Peter, is praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the result is that God will prove the character of our faith. Right? That's, the, that's the journey he's taking us on. He wants to prove our character. And so that because of that, he will subject us to trials, just like he did to Abraham, but it's to give us an opportunity to, to worship him and to, again, to obtain that praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. So I think the bottom line of that is that true worship is proven as we follow God obediently down the afflicted path that he asks, asks us to walk, whatever that happens to be. And so if we ask the question of, do we want to worship God? Do we want to worship Christ? Then the invitation, we go back right to, to week one. The invitation of Christ then is to come, take up your cross, not take up, again, this is not just talking about his cross at this point. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. Right? But prior to that, the cross was known as a means of death. That if you picked up your cross, it's because you were going to your imminent death. So Christ is saying, come, take up your cross and follow me. And that death isn't just a physical thing. That death is a spiritual thing. It's that death of our own, again, our own souls, our own desires. 
as we pick up that cross and follow Christ. It's learning to become more and more like Him. So I think that is what we see worship is in Scripture, right? That is worship. Now that can be manifested in in singing and speaking, right? That can be a, as we sing, as we as we do what we would call worship on a, on a Sunday morning. That's still worship, but where is it coming out of? Right? That, that's the most important thing. It's just singing, just, just speaking the words doesn't make anything a reality. Um, but it is a way that we can manifest the worship or the reality in our lives. You know, and it's not just, it's not just Peter that talked about this. That same definition of worship is confirmed by Paul in Romans chapter 12. Uh, verse 1, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so those are interesting words based on what we've just read about Abraham. Right? Because Paul is saying, just like Isaac was being presented as a sacrifice, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So again, we have worship being tied here very clearly to sacrifice. You know, that we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, and whether it's the example of Abraham presenting Isaac on the altar as, as worship, whether it's offering our own bodies as a living, living sacrifice as worship, both of those require faith and yielding to God's will for us to come to that point. Because the purpose of this sacrifice, if we focus on, for, on us for a moment, the purpose of the sacrifice is to reduce our flesh. Right? It's to reduce just the inherent nature within us that we're born with. To allow the Spirit of Christ to be manifested in our bodies. To allow, as 2 Corinthians 4.11 says, for the Spirit of Christ to be manifested in our mortal flesh. Again, we agree that the Spirit of Christ will be manifested one day in a glorified state. And that's, I think, easy to, to say and accept and agree with. But Paul says that it can be manifested in our mortal flesh. I think that's the goal that he was striving towards, that he was working towards. That was the race that he was running. And so I think that's the purpose of that sacrifice, is to reduce that flesh, to allow Christ his spirit to be manifested in us. You know, that seed that is born within needs place and opportunity to grow and to be shown. And that's part of those trials, part of those sufferings is to allow those things, to allow that truth, reality within you when you decide to follow Christ, when you accept Christ as Savior and Lord. It's giving opportunity for those things to grow within you, to be manifested within you. And again, I think that is worship. That is true worship. The problem sometimes um, is that I think we're prone to self-deception. Right? Christ said that in Matthew 15, 7 to 8. And this is talking to the Pharisees. He says, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me. So again, it's easy to, to speak things or, or sing things um, that aren't true in our lives. So we can honor God with our mouths. We can say the right things, but God knows if our hearts are far from Him. All right, we can appear to be, be worshipers in church, but the truth is proven by what we do outside of these doors. Right? The truth is proven in the way that we live our lives by the decisions that we make. And so I think the question for, for each of us to reflect on is, have, if we have accepted that invitation of Christ, uh, if we accept it to call a disciple, discipleship, then are we willing to walk down the afflicted path that he's invited us on? That he is that narrow gate, that entryway into that narrow path, but are we willing to walk that afflicted path? You know, willing to, to yield to, to God's leading to, to follow Christ. You know, we're willing to, to bear our cross. Are we willing to be content with suffering and, and trials when they come along? 
knowing what our end goal is, knowing what our focus is. You know, if we lose sight of the focus, if we lose sight of the goal, when suffering and trials come along, when we're asked to pick up our cross, probably not going to. If we're just doing it in our own strength, our own abilities, it's just, it's not gonna work. But I think the reality in, in, you know, at the end of the day is that Christ is inviting us to embrace, I think, a radically different life than we would choose for ourselves. You know, we don't always like to say that in church, uh, but I think that it's true that we're called down a path that it's not one that we would always enjoy. It's not one that, you know, if we, if we were mapping out our lives, it's not the one we would necessarily choose, but that's still what Christ is asking us to embrace. It's still the path that he's asking us to go down, knowing that the goal is to follow the example that he set. Knowing that the goal is to allow his spirit to work within us, to begin to display the fruit of the spirit. You know, the love, joy, peace, all of those things. It's to display that just like he did, perfectly. I mean, if we're not going to be perfect because we have a sinful nature. But he is the example that is given for us to follow. And so, you know, just like in, in wrapping up, just as, you know, as God did with Abraham, he's inviting us to a sacrificial life where we need to lay down our lives on the altar, right? That's what he's inviting us to. But the good news, you know, if we go back to the verse we read a few moments ago uh, from Abraham and Isaac, you know, we've taught in the past that Isaac represents Christ. You know, we've talked about types and shadows a lot. And Isaac is a picture of Christ. And I think that's relevant when you see that Isaac here on the altar representing Christ. And we have you know, this talk about resurrection, that Abraham had faith that Isaac would be resurrected. There's a lot of pictures there. We won't get into it this morning. But the thing I do want to focus on is that God provided a lamb. Or he provided salvation in that moment. I don't think... Words in scripture aren't accidental. You know, those, those words are intentional. So God provided himself a lamb. And the good news for us is that God has provided a lamb. When we are willing to lay our lives down on the altar, God has provided a lamb that will empower us to live out that life that he's called us to. He'll empower us to, to walk that afflicted path. You know, because if it was on our own, if we didn't have the Spirit of Christ, the power of Christ, the Lamb of God within us, we could never walk that path. But with His Spirit, with Him as our focus, I believe that we can. I believe that that is possible. I believe that's the path that we're called to walk down. And it won't always be easy. Uh, many people uh, may not like that if you, if you do that, if you tell them that they need to do that. Um, but... Again, it's not always going to be easy, but if your focus is on Christ, uh, I believe in the end, I know in the end that it's worth it. Uh, I know that in the end, the focus that Paul had was on the goal. His focus was on the prize. Um, earthly things will pass away, uh, but what is that reward that is awaiting those who would put their faith, trust, and obedience in God uh, and live that out in their daily lives?